I'm coming. Hey, have a great time down in London. Remind me, what's this meeting you're going to oh, again? Do you not listen? It's with the WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union. You know, with the Pankhursts and the Pethic Lawrences. Oh, yeah, I've heard good things about them. Well, I reckon it might be the best way forward for us. Well, let's hope so. Anyway, I've got to go work first. Well, it's a good job you work for a cooperative, because you won't get the time off from any other factory around here. Now, look, don't forget, there's a pot of stew on the stove for you and the kids. Or you need to pick up a loaf of bread from the baker's. Oh, save me some bread and gravy, will you? If you're lucky. <laughs> Ta -ra! See you later, Duck. I enjoyed working at Equity Shoes. Don't get me wrong, the hours were long and the work could be boring at times, but I was surrounded by a great group of women, many who were socialists like me, and we spent a lot of time trying to set the world to rights, trying to improve working conditions in the boot and shoe industry, which Leicester was at the heart of. You see, it wasn't really fair, was it? Here I was doing a job just as well as a man, same hours, same level of responsibility, but only getting a third of the wages. I'm Peter Barrett, a proud great-grandson of Alice Hawkins. Alice was involved in politics from an early age, working in the boot and shoe factories along with thousands of other Leicester women. She became deeply involved in the Independent Labour Party and the Women's Cooperative Guild. For Alice, Votes for Women was the key to unlocking improvements in working conditions for her fellow women workers. So when she heard the news that Asquith, the Prime Minister at the time, was finally about to give women the vote, she felt compelled to show her support at the WSPU meeting in London. As Miss Pankhurst spoke, all of us in the room realised that even now, after 40 years of quietly and patiently petitioning the government for our right to have a voice in how the country was run, our demands were being ignored and denied once again. We have waited too long for political justice. We refuse to wait any longer. the chaos and the mayhem, the bobbies grabbed me. Not just me, mind, but many other women were arrested on that day. All of us hauled off to Holloway Prison. Now, I've always been the sort of person to stand up for what they believe in. I think that everyone should, but I've got to tell you that I was scared about what might be coming next. Sisters, 
I needn't have worried about prison. The support and solidarity I experienced inside gave me a clearer sense of purpose than I'd ever felt before. You all right, Doc? Did they treat you all right in there? It was all right, but a bit I'm fine. I've missed you. The kids haven't, oh, they can't wait to see you. Oh, come on, let's get out of this place and go home then. speaking in front of all of us women in a, in a packed house hall. Yes, they're a different class to us, but their hearts are in the right place and they're right. Deeds, not words. It's the only way forward. You see, the government just aren't listening to us. And if we want things to change, then we have to take action. But what about prison? Can you really face going in there again? Oh, oh, Alfred, it was hard at first. But there were other women from the protest in there and all. All sorts of women from all walks of life, all standing up for what they know is right. And Sylvia Pankhurst was in there, and we got talking about the shoe trade and what we've been doing up here in Leicester. And Alfred... I've made a big decision. What's that, love? I'm going to dedicate myself to the great fight for women. I've joined the suffragettes. I'm with you. Come on. Sunday in Hyde Park. I'd never seen anything like it. They reckon that between 300 and 500,000 demonstrators were there. And over 60 speakers, people like Millicent Fawcett and Annie Kenny. And now that we had our own WSPU branch, I'd been invited. Me, a shoe machinist from Leicester, to speak from platform number five. with being constantly told that I do not count. 
that what I have to say is meaningless and that my opinions and actions are purely emotional and are driven by erratic and irrational behaviour. I have a voice and I will use it. I am not satisfied with being in the shadows or being the doormat on which society wiped their feet. I have a voice and I will use it. I am a taxpayer who contributes to the upkeep of this country, so why should I not have a voice? Don't stand on the sidelines, but jump in with both stocking feet. We must fight for freedom, for liberation, liberation from the chains that have bound us all for far too long. But not everyone liked the message we were spreading that women deserved the right to vote. was sometimes knocked down, it just made me even more determined. I wasn't going to give up. Through all this struggle, the politicians were starting to support us. The introduction of the Conciliation Bill would have allowed at least a million women to take part in national elections. But once again, our Prime Minister, Mr Asquith, found a way to stop it passing through Parliament. Once again, we had no other option but to march on Westminster. Looking back to the past, looking back now to the suffragettes about how they stood their ground, I think is a very important message for women of now. I think, I think if I felt disenfranchised enough, I would be prepared to go to prison. If you've got courage, it means you're standing up for something that you feel within your heart, um, regardless of what society says, regardless of what the law says. Yes, I would be prepared to break the law if I believed in something really strongly and there was no other option. Alice Hawkins went to prison five times for her beliefs and that helped to change history. I'm not sure I would ever be that brave.
my dearest Alfred, how I miss you and the children. The picture of your faces has helped me fight the misery that I have endured here these last seven days. Every bone in my body aches, but I know you will support me through these troubled times, and this gives me great strength. I am still recovering from the horrors of the assault of that Black Friday. About 300 of us went to Parliament to tell Asquith what we thought about his treachery. We were met by a large body of police and they were simply horrid. There were organised roughs in the crowds and I was very much bruised about my arms and body. No other civilised country would treat their women in such a manner. The prison is cold and dark. The walls drip with moisture. I have refused all food I have been offered and haven't eaten for seven days. Thankfully, I have not been force-fed yet, unlike some of my sisters. I shall never, while I live, forget the horror of hearing the screams and the violent struggles of those being abused in this way. It is a scandal, nothing short of torture. I shall go back to Leicester and get more women to revolt. They're trying to break us, but our spirit is stronger and we shall resist. Mrs Pankhurst has given us new instructions. There is something that governments care for far more than human life, and that is the security of property. And so it is through property that we shall strike the enemy. Be militant, each in your own way. I incite you to rebellion. Sports facilities were an obvious target. Politicians and men love sport, especially golf. Well, they wouldn't be playing here once we're finished. damaged by suffragettes, and not just in London. <laughs> Government and commercial buildings suffered heavily through coordinated attacks by hundreds of women. Until there were votes for women, no property was safe. We made a lot of noise. We got a lot of attention. Certain women have broken the law in a way we all deplore. These militant outrages are a strong and serious argument against woman suffrage itself. If you give way to this agitation, you give way to the agitation of the minority. And I believe it is the most disgraceful agitation that has ever been! Yeah. Even
even with the politicians and press against us, we still couldn't stop because we still didn't have a voice. charge of placing Black Brunswick Inc. in several letterboxes in and around Leicester. I therefore sentence you to a month in prison in the second division. about you. There's a bad feeling out there against the suffragettes. They smashed the windows of the WSPU shop on Bowling Green Street again. And everybody's talking about you and Violet getting mobbed the last time you gave a speech down on Market Square. They're saying you deserved it. We can't stop. Not now, otherwise what's it all been for? But is it changing anything? The suffragettes used to be so colourful and Bold, but now it's different. They treat us like petty thieves. And look at you, Alice. You're exhausted. Oh, Alfred. We can't let Asquith and Lloyd George win. You know that. You know we can't do that. We need to break them. And we're that close. But they're going to break you first. Prison and hunger striking. It's doing you all in. Look at Mrs. Panker. She can barely stand on her own two feet. Well, I can't stop. Not now. The war changed everything. In less than a week, the Pankhurst did a deal with the government. They released all the suffragettes in prison and the WSPU agreed to cease all militant activities and support the war effort. I think everyone on all sides was glad to stop. Everyone had had enough. Those were desperate measures, but they were desperate times. The struggle for women's suffrage continued through the war years, just in a different context. And women proved they were worthy citizens, capable of tackling men's jobs. Finally, emerging out of the darkness of wartime depression, the Representation of the People Act became law in 1918. 
primarily giving the vote to millions of young men who had fought for their country in the Great War, but also extending the franchise to women over the age of 30 for the first time. Even though it wasn't votes for all women, I was so proud, so happy. Happy for all those women and men who fought for so long. For decades full of blood, sweat and tears. We'd done it. All of us, suffragists and suffragettes. We'd finally got our foot in the door. This was really it. A turning point in history. A new dawn for women. never not voted and I get incredibly moved every time I go to the poll because I think about all the women who sacrifice so much to get there. Yes, I did vote in the last election. It's important to me because it's a hard one, right? Um, and actually, I want to make sure I have my say. When I go to vote, I feel I've been able to influence change, uh, change in making things better, not only for myself, but for my family and for my local community. My mum always brought me up to vote, uh, and she always said, um, you know, women had sacrificed for this, you must use your vote, and I say the same thing to my daughter. If we don't use our vote, then we've no right to complain about anything. Alice's work wasn't done. She continued to fight for women's rights within the ranks of the Labour Party, focusing on working conditions and equal pay. Her commitment to the women's movement never left her. We've got the vote, but how many women have we got in Parliament? How many MPs have we got, especially from ethnic minority backgrounds? Men are different from women. I think the science tells us that they work different ways and I think that's fine. It is all about how you value each one. I broke glass ceiling. I became the first Asian female Lord Mayor of Britain. What needs to change for women is that there absolutely has to be equal pay, there has to be childcare provision, and that women should always be able to compete with men on a level playing field. Ultimately, it's education. We have to educate people and we have to educate men and women that we need to change this situation in order to have a more positive future. If Alice Hawkins were here today, 100 years on, I think she would say to young people to have courage, to fight harder, to be stronger and, uh, and to, to push forward. Yeah.